Good evening and hello to everyone here at DEPCONF 18. This is the next speech from Catherine uh, Sutter about uh, in the 1968 mom built a computer women's route uh, to Technic. So please give a warm welcome to Catherine. Hello. This is not the type of talk I normally do, so I will put my applied social theory lens on it. Um, I go by Catherine, Kathy, and on IRC I am DLib. I do applied social theory. I have a broad behavioral science background. My bachelor's degree was focusing in human development. I actually was interested in neurochemistry and nutrition. Uh, but I, and public health, but I, when I went into, I decided that the political and policy questions were greater than the scientific questions. I'd like to introduce an idea of legitimate peripheral participation, and that, that uh, shapes a community differently. Instead of thinking of newcomers coming in from the bottom and becoming, and going up towards the top of higher power, we think of a community as coming from, of newcomers coming from the edges, and then judge how well do we bring those newcomers in, how open and, and permeable are the boundaries, and do we give meaningful roles to new contributors. And that is the lens I will use to describe the story of my mother and difficulties and barriers she had to enter a career in tech. So, I never really thought of my mother as very successful, but I also get irritated with mom jokes. And I'd like to say, I think some of these, she might be unusual, but it's too bad. I think there are many women and many other people's stories that have similar kinds of barriers. So I'll try to use her as an example. Notice in this picture of a, a computer, a plastic computer you could build yourself, they had trouble uh, marketing it so they're trying to tell people, no, really, it's fun. It's not just really complicated sets of things you have to put together. And so they put a father with a daughter in the picture in the front. Which, now, if we had had a son there, you would think the father was training the son. But with the daughter, it's more fun and enjoyable. He's, it's interesting that there's a little girl on there. My, my mother's life, I'd like to start the story with my grandfather. He worked for Presta. Uh, Presta, um, he was a fine woodworker and he created the molds for their foundry, their production of uh, steel cookware. In his off hours, he's a very creative person, he decided that the complicated clamps on the pressure cookers made them too complicated, and so he invented this way of putting a lid on and turning it. And my grandmother said that this is the reason why these handles never fit women's hands. He carved it for his own hand. My mother was trained by her mother in the Depression era to be very, very frugal. She learned, she was very uh, interested. They were all DIY, they're pioneers in the US, uh, very hands-on kinds of folks, and uh, lived in a small pioneer town in Wisconsin. And she learned this kind of practical geometry uh, in sewing with her mother. And she was very interested in fabrics and quality. <clears throat> but she was the second child and they had no boy. So my grandfather said, no, let Gretchen come into the shop and work with me. I gave an example of the kind of machinery of that era. I uh, don't have a picture of his shop. But she did things like, uh, because he was disappointed that this new pressure cooker that he invented became, belonged to Preston instead of himself, uh, he formed his own company and he hired my mother to work after school for many years. So they, for example, she would do the mathematics of a dial to, that would show if you want to cook beef in your pressure cooker, how many minutes will it take? And so she did all the math at the dining room table to figure out how to do that, that shape. In a, college crafting, in a college drafting class that she took in a community college after high school, she did well, and so her family sent her to art school. 
And she always said, if I had been a boy, they would have realized I was really an engineer. She was, she, her aesthetic sense wasn't so great. But she was very beautiful. At the time, uh, she, there were some technical jobs open for women. She became a sewing machine repair person. And the story I normally heard about that was Kathy, uh, she didn't have much of a clothing sense, but she said, just remember, never wear a red dress to a job interview. And then she would tell the story of how she wore a red dress to this job interview, and the boss took her to a conference and only booked one room in the motel, and so she left. Because, and then she said that the fault was that she didn't know you're not supposed to wear a red dress to a job interview. When she married my father and went to Germany for the US Army, uh, she had a great love, and that was her Faf uh, 332 sewing machine. Very absorbed in it. This picture of the inner workings of it, this is her passion. I've seen her. She taught me on this, not this exact machine, but this model all my life. And she didn't really teach me about clothes or uh, making clothes, but she taught me about the mechanics of the machine and how to use it. Elvis Presley was on the base at that time. She really wasn't very impressed with him, but she really loved the best German engineered sewing machine she had ever seen. Oh, that's me in the little picture with my mom. As a single mother, she uh, found a job as a department store detective, meaning she was a secret shopper. And she complained that the managers were watching the women in the uh, dressing rooms. And, make, and making rude jokes about them through the two-way mirrors, and she was fired. She became a waitress. Uh, later, she uh, had a job uh, with a vending machine maintenance company. She would travel around, uh, and she found out through uh, some kind of social event that the men were making extremely more money than she was, doing the same work, maybe less. And uh, she asked why they made more money, and Catermatt told her it was because they had families to support. But she had three children in a one-bedroom apart one apartment that she could not tell them about, or she would not be allowed to have the job, a single woman with three children. She was not a very happy person, but she found things to keep herself busy and feeling like she was working somewhere into the future. She, in the 1960s, there were many of these electronics uh, mail order courses offered in the newspapers, and she signed up for one of these, and she studied it in her spare time after working full time as a, for Catermat. I remember it was 68 or 69, because at that time, I remember her waking us up uh, to watch this vision of a man stepping on the moon and how excited she was. We had very little money. Sometimes there was not enough money for dinner to have a good meal. But for fun, we would go on Saturdays to a flea market. And she would give us each 50 cents or a dollar. We could buy anything she, we wanted. And what she would buy with me were these appliances, a, a toaster, a, an oven that looked like this one, and this uh, photographic equipment. And she would fix them. And that would be our entertainment and things to do for fun during the week. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I went out to the dining room, and I was tired. And now, my mother's a very tired person, right? She works very hard. And she had all these plastic pieces all over the table, red and white, and all these lines, and these pieces of tape and labels. And I was like, Mom, what are you doing? I was just coming to get a glass of water. And she said, look, Kathy, it's a computer. You know, what's that? You know. You can help me. Here, help me sort this and this. And she gave me the instruction manual. And I looked at it, and I was too tired. And I went back to bed. But she worked on that for a long time. And she was very excited that she made it work. So remember, at the time, the computers looked like this. But she had one on her own kitchen table. So other ways in which she was technical, uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. This book is about the pesticides and environmental hazards that we were all very, very frightened by when it was, came out. We all read that. Vitamin C and the Common Cold by Linus Pauling. 
uh, talking about this idea of these molecules called amino acids and other vitamins, meaning they were absolutely required for life and how you shouldn't eat uh, foods that lose these things for vitamins and then uh, how to eat it. Adele Davis was her favorite author probably all her life and Linus Pauling. Finally, um, still working full time now as a housekeeper, as a maid doing house cleaning, the US government started funding this thing called community colleges. And I remember um, she, the slide rule became the thing that made her happy. She would just try to teach me how to use the slide rule and she was so excited about it and the algebra and, and the note, careful notes she would take. Uh, she wanted to go for a nutrition degree but she, had to, she couldn't use that much time. So she got a two year degree as a chemical technician. She applied for a job with that chemical technician degree at RCA, Radio Corporation of America. And they said that at the time, they had many applicants like her, uh, but the reason she stood out is they had never before met anyone to finish a home electronics course. What? Home electronics course, this correspondence where you make something electronic and then send it, mail it to the company and they grade it and mail it you the next assignment and then grade you a test, all done by mail. And so people would start these things and never finish them and she finished them and they said that's the reason she, they gave her the, that, uh, that they gave her that job. So I found this photo of the folks that she worked with because these are the folks in the older facility before the Somerville facility was built and uh, about three years before and they look like what I remember because at the time I was in high school and they looked like that and she talked about them. So she was given a special, she had some ideas about how to fit the electronics on a silicon chip into a smaller form factor. This is what they were working on. She had ideas that uh, they found interesting and they gave her permission to do special projects where she had access to the entire laboratory. This is stepping on the toes of the more senior women who have been there a long time. And in order to gain their trust, she wasn't really into it, but at lunchtime they did crocheting. So she would, she told me that what she did was she let them teach her how to crochet, and then she went home and stayed up around the clock for much of a week to impress them with how fast she put out this crochet blanket that was better than what they had taught her to do. And she gained their trust. She also told me the story of how, um, I don't know if it was these women, but women of these, this generation, and for all I know it might have been some of these women, who would take their uh, very fine motor skills and their experience with fiber work and had been wrapping uh, wires for the computer systems for NASA. And this was an inspiring story for her. And she would make fun of these old ladies that were more impressed by crochet, but she was very proud of how well she had done at it. So the thing that she was working on, you'll notice in this slide, it's talking about the layers in the silicon chips and the way the circuits are attached to each other. In this particular chip, what they were trying to do was make it smaller and they were finding, what, how she explained to me what they were doing is that they would, were trying to get the curves. She was working on how to make the curves connect more tightly and eventually they found a, a different crystal structure that made that easier which is interesting because she married a world-renowned material physicist at the time and they would talk about things like uh, crystal structures. I believe this may have been the very chip that she was working on. Um, it's because it, I found a research report that was declassified out of RCA from 1974 it looks vaguely like the pictures I remember when I was a child, although I wouldn't go by that. She said that she imaged a picture of me as a baby on one of the layers, but I don't think it's findable. <laughs> um, and apparently it was very unusual for the time. This was her dream job. She was the happiest I had ever seen her in my life. She bonded with my, fa my stepfather over their shared technical interests. Uh, this is a computer I believe is the one that they built in the kitchen table and made sure that we were not part of it. Parts of the computer all over the table, all over the place for quite a while. 
I had a TRS-102 that I played with, but I thought I'd pick up this picture. It just reminded me of the kind of magazines around the house. So then it turns out that her job bumped my military and corporate CEO kind of stepfather's tax bracket higher than her income brought in. So she quit the job. But, st so I didn't think of that as a success, and she was very unhappy, but this is a picture of my mother happy. I don't remember what program she was learning, but she was ex very excited because she was writing programming. She was learning programming, and she was happy about it. And this is a computer she was using at the time. I didn't actually, I had already gone off to University of Illinois uh, at that time, but when I would come back home, this was a closet off of the kitchen where she did her work. This was in Chicago at this time. I didn't grow up there, but at this time during college, they were, uh, he was working for Standard Oil of Indiana. Um, so my summary. So what are the take-home lessons here? I think that all of this, these not really happy aspects of the story can be summarized by, as a lack of pathways or access to legitimate peripheral participation in tech. She did these things that showed her capacity, her knowledge, her enthusiasm, but at each step, because she was female, these little hurdles kept getting thrown at her that were big enough to derail her. Um, so poor access to meaningful work on the edges. Uh, inappropriately tracked into traditional women's roles. But also persistence and cleverness in finding new entry points into technology. I'm sorry this isn't a happier story for me to tell. I really appreciate you guys listening. And, I, and this is the end of this part of the talk. This is a time check. Is there any room for five minutes? I think an interesting thing to talk about would be how does a newcomer who doesn't look like the people in the center of the group become, get given roles that allow them to become more central? Hi, thank you very much for the talk. It was really very interesting. Um, so personally, I can totally relate to the, to the topic because I have finished for international affairs and diplomacy, so which means that I have a background in social sciences. And uh, recently, I've been um, learning Python as I see that the, um, that the future kind of, of the market of the place that I'm living is requiring a lot of people that has technical skills. Mm. So how do you think that those two things, things can merge together and can create in the end something that is very nice and can be useful? Are you asking for career advice? No, I am <laughs> asking how can you combine those two things uh. and can make it like, so people cannot just be technical or just be in the social uh, field, yeah. but they can somehow merge those two things together and can um, come up with something nice because I heard in the beginning of the presentations that you were in the uh, that you were in the science uh, part, but then thought to go more in the social yeah. in the social aspect. So more, it's like why do you had to do this um, right, this right. this exchange? I I think that's a great question. It's often a gendered question. So mm -hmm. one of the things that you can sit down. Right? Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you want to stand there, it's fine. But um, okay, here's one of my bugaboos. One of the things that annoys me is that uh, social policy is being set by technically minded people right now who tend to be young men. How people should get along with each other tends to be women's work. That's no big deal. We have plenty of women who can work on it. But because technically minded men have, are so needed right now, uh, have such a high demand, 
uh, get constant praise by your skills and uh, abilities and knowledge. And I find this more so among engineers than among scientists. Scientists are more, ten, in general, the scientific field tends to be more excited by questions and engineers, my, my stereotype, are more interested in answers, right? So one of the problems I see is not knowing where your own blind spots are. You look for a technical solution on something when the goal hasn't been set up correctly. So uh, how do you bring in, for in this example, someone, the women's work, you know, what? Oh, they're in, re, in human resources. How much power do they have? So I know that's not a complete answer to your question, but I think it's, it's part of the problem, yeah. I'm being told I have one minute. Anybody want to say anything else? Okay. Um, so I've been thinking about this, uh, how to come from the edge to the center. Uh -huh. And um, in Debian specifically, like we, we do a lot of effort to acknowledge contributions from contributors in different areas. So artists, uh, lawyers, or and we have the non-uploading -upload, DDs. And I'm afraid that when we accept, acknowledge contributions, uh, contributors in those areas, and we tag them as, <laughs> I need to, to breathe. As? No, when, when we, when, uh, let's say, an, a new uh, developer enters the community as a non-uploading DD, for instance, it, it's hard then to break the, to, to cross the line and become an, an uploading DD. Hmm. So when you enter the community by the edge, with a small contribution, translating, or... Mm. So where is the meaningful path? Uh, an example when I was reading about this theory of participation uh, on the periphery and making it legitimate, an example was used as a butcher shop. In an old butcher shop, the head butcher would be in the middle, but the assistant butchers would be somewhere nearby doing more menial tasks, but they always had visual access and could see the more advanced positions, and so over time, and with opportunity and with need, they could step into those roles. Yeah, but then it's, That's visible it's and really accessible. hard. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. I think when we have separate uh, roles, and then for the migration, uh, like if we as a community are not uh, with a good eye on that, like to give opportunity for those people that we already said, oh, you you are this kind of contributor, and you are, yeah, yeah. and then so it's on, on Tuesday. I'm forgetting the time. I will be uh, facilitating a conversation between any team members who would like to arrive to talk about how teams can help each other in terms of how they govern their groups. And it can include questions of how bringing in new peppers if people want to. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah.